Good afternoon. I'm Rhea Suarez with the Cancer Support Community. Welcome to our webinar, Frankly Speaking About Cancer, Coping with the Cost of Care, hosted by the Cancer Support Community and sponsored by the Patient Access Network Foundation. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require technical assistance during the conference, please dial 1-866-229-3239, option number one. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. As mentioned, today's call is being recorded and will be made available on the Cancer Support Community website at cancersupportcommunity.org slash webinar. The format of today's webinar will be as follows. Our presenters will be featured first, and then we will begin the question and answer portion. To ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box on the right. You may submit a question through the box at any time during the event. At the end of the, at the, end of the webinar, you will be redirected to the post-event survey. Please complete this survey as your input is invaluable to us. The survey will only take a few minutes. It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers, Joanna Morales and Sean Hebel. Joanna Morales is CEO of Triage Cancer. She is a cancer rights attorney, author, and speaker, and has spent more than 19 years working on behalf of individuals with cancer. Joanna received a Juris Doctor from Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, and received her under, undergraduate degree from UCLA. Sean Hebel is a program director for the Cancer Support Community Delaware. Sean is a licensed clinical social worker and a certified oncology social worker who has worked with people impacted by cancer since 1983. Sean received his Master's of Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania and received his undergraduate degree from Antioch University. Sean, I now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Rhea. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor about the cancer support community. Backed by evidence that the best cancer care includes social and emotional support, the cancer support community offers a menu of personalized services and education for people with cancer and their families. In 2009, the wellness community and Gilda's Club worldwide joined forces to become the cancer support community. CSC provides the highest quality emotional and social support through a network of more than 50 local affiliates, 100 satellite locations, and a robust online community. Some of the cancer support community's resources include the Open to Options program, which is a one-on-one -on -one treatment decision counseling program, the Cancer Experience Registry, which is open to anyone who's ever been diagnosed with cancer, this registry explores the social and emotional impact of cancer. The Cancer Support Helpline, a toll-free helpline staffed by licensed mental health professionals to assist you. And online support groups, which can be accessed on CSC's website. And of course, our affiliate network of over 55 locations, which offer in-person support, mind-body programming, and other resources. An overview of today's program includes talking with your healthcare team about the financial, employment, and disability issues, discussing health insurance, including appeals, and what are the options for obtaining prescription medications, and other potential resource sources of financial support. We all know the physical and emotional toll that cancer can take, but I hear every day in the support groups here in Delaware the significant financial toll that can be taken as well. The financial issues are pretty difficult to bring up, and the healthcare team frequently doesn't bring them up either. Uh, I asked some of the support group members recently to address some of the issues around financial concerns, and they came up with several issues. One was the fear of not being treated due to insurance, or lack of it, and anxiety, especially regarding uh, changes that might be uh, forthcoming with the Affordable Care Act. They also expressed concerns about losing a job due to missed time and of working through treatment and what protections were offered through the uh, Americans with Disability Act. They expressed anxiety about decreased income at work due to missed time, and there were plenty of concerns about short and long-term disability issues. 
whether it be insurance co-pays, equipment, supplies, transportation, missed time from work. A person diagnosed from cancer frequently has additional bills at a time and their income might suffer from a loss of work, having to take FLMA or go on disability. Now, I'm fortunate to live in a state where two years uh, of uh, cancer care is provided if, you do not, if you're diagnosed in Delaware and don't have insurance. Even with that, I have worked over the last several years with more than one person that have had to declare bankruptcy due to uh, bills they were not able to be taken care of. As I mentioned, talking about money is difficult, and the healthcare team does not always bring it up. But understanding what our options are is very important. And by taking an active approach toward the cost of care, you can improve the quality of life. I'm going to turn it over now. Hopefully this sets the stage for Joanna's uh, talks as she uh, uh, talks for the rest of the uh, webinar. Joanna? Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you an overview of some of the key issues that Sean talked about that are a concern of many individuals who've been diagnosed with cancer. And we're going to start with health insurance. And really the best place to go to find information about your health insurance options is the relatively new website called healthcare.gov. And healthcare.gov is uh, run by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And you can go to the homepage of the website, which is what's on the slide, and click that green button that says Start Now and answer a few questions about yourself um, without any personal identifiable information and get information about your specific health insurance options. Now, this website is also available in Spanish, um, but there's also a toll-free telephone number where you can call and get information about your health insurance options in English and 150 different languages. So if someone is leaving their job or concerned about losing their job or maybe even reducing their hours from full-time to part-time, there is a federal law called COBRA that applies to private employers with 20 or more employees. And COBRA allows you to keep the same employer-based health insurance coverage that you had at work for an additional period of time. But the downside of COBRA is that you're going to be required to pay the full amount of what your employer was paying for your health insurance coverage. And that can be incredibly expensive um, depending on how good your coverage was provided by your employer. So if you want more information about COBRA coverage, the U.S. Department of Labor is the federal agency that oversees COBRA, and specifically the Department of the Employee Benefits and Security Administration. So we've included the website for that information on the slide. Now, to give you some tips about using COBRA coverage, um, I said that COBRA coverage will last a certain period of time, and that period of time depends on your qualifying event. And a qualifying event is something that happens that allows you to be eligible for COBRA coverage. So, for example, if you lose your job, you'll get access to COBRA coverage for a minimum of 18 months. But if you age out of your parents' health insurance plan, then you'll have access to COBRA coverage for 36 months. So because COBRA premiums can be expensive, there are some financial assistance programs that are out there available to help you with your COBRA premiums, um, including a state program that's run through your Medicaid, um, and that program is called the Health Insurance Premium Payment Program, or some version of that. So it's called something a little bit different in every state, but if you contact your state Medicaid program, you can find out more information. Now, you, when you become eligible for COBRA coverage, you actually have 60 days to decide that you want to take COBRA coverage. Um, but once you decide, you need to make sure that you're paying your premiums on time because if you're late, you'll lose access to your COBRA coverage, and it's just about impossible to get it back. Um, so you want to make sure that you're paying your COBRA premiums um, on time. Now, there are also some circumstances where your COBRA coverage might end earlier. Um, and one example of that would be if your employer stops offering COBRA coverage or uh, stops offering health insurance coverage to all of the employees. 
So it, your COBRA coverage is then tied to your employer's plan. So if your employer's plan goes away, your COBRA coverage will go away as well. And that also applies to employers that either go out of business or close their doors. Now, if you um, are on COBRA coverage and you become eligible for Medicare, then your COBRA coverage will also end early. So the question becomes what happens when your COBRA does end? What are your options for health insurance coverage if you have a pre-existing medical condition such as cancer? And that brings us to HIPAA plans. And HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And most people are familiar with HIPAA because of its privacy protections, um, but it also provided some health insurance protections. And one of the ways that it did that was by creating access to individual health insurance coverage through these HIPAA plans. And they're also referred to as guaranteed issue plans or federally insured plans because they're guaranteed to be issued to you. If you want access to a HIPAA plan, you cannot be denied because of your pre-existing condition. But the options that are available to you for a HIPAA plan are different in every state. So you need to contact your state insurance agency for more information about the HIPAA plan options available to you. In order to be eligible for a HIPAA plan, you actually have to exhaust your COBRA coverage. And what that means is that you have to use up all of the COBRA coverage that you're eligible for. So if you're eligible for 36 months of COBRA coverage, you have to use up all 36 months and then can move to a HIPAA plan. And when you move to that HIPAA plan, you can't wait longer than 63 days to get access to that HIPAA plan. So if you wait 64 days, you're going to lose access to a HIPAA plan as an option available to you. And in general, you never really want to have a gap in your health insurance coverage that lasts longer than 63 days because you lose access to some of these protections that I'm going to talk about. Um, but in addition, you also have to not be eligible for Medicare, Medicaid, or some other type of group health insurance coverage in order to get access to a HIPAA plan. So there are a few other things that HIPAA did around pre-existing conditions. And when generally when you're moving between two jobs, uh, that new job, if it's offering you group health insurance coverage, if it offers coverage to all employees, then it has to offer coverage to you as well, even if you have a pre-existing condition. But it can ask that you face a pre-existing condition exclusion period, which is kind of a mouthful. So that's a period of time that that health insurance plan isn't going to cover anything related to a pre-existing condition, and that's any type of medical condition that you might have. But HIPAA actually limits that period of time that they can impose a pre-existing condition exclusion period to 12 months, and then gives you a way to reduce or eliminate that exclusion period entirely through something called creditable coverage. And creditable coverage is credit that you get for time that you had health insurance coverage in the past. Um, but again, that's only if you have continuous health insurance coverage and don't see any gap that lasts longer than 63 days. HIPAA also limits the time period that an insurance company can look back into your medical history to decide whether or not you have a pre-existing condition. And they limit that look back period to six months. Now, there are also two federal health insurance programs, Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid is specifically for individuals who have a low income level, a low asset level, and generally meet some other eligibility category. For example, individuals with disabilities or seniors. And Medicaid is funded by both federal and state governments. Um, and because it's a, it's a combination, the the states have the ability to make some changes to their Medicaid programs. And so it means that the rules from state to state can vary. Um, and you have to actually find out what the rules are specifically in your state for Medicaid. Uh, but for information about the Medicaid program, you can start with Medicaid.gov and then get information 
about your program specifically. Now, Medicare is the federal health insurance program for individuals who are 65 and older who have been re are receiving Social Security benefits or individuals who have been receiving Social Security disability benefits for at least 24 months. And then there's a few other categories of individuals who are entitled to Medicare. But for information about Medicare and its benefits, you can go to Medicare.gov and on that website, I recommend that you look for a publication called Medicare and You. And this is a guide that they release every year for Medicare beneficiaries that has all of the details about Medicare and the cost of Medicare and the enrollment process. Um, and it's really written for um, a lay audience, so it's a very useful tool for navigating Medicare benefits. Now, the way that Medicare uh, generally works is that there's four parts to Medicare. So Medicare Part A is typically free for most people who are on Medicare, and it covers inpatient care. So it covers hospitalization. Medicare Part B is available to individuals, but people have the opportunity to decline Medicare Part B coverage, but it's really the coverage that is the meat of Medicare. So it covers the majority of things that people use under Medicare, like outpatient visits, durable medical equipment, lab work, things like that. And so most people have Medicare Part A and Part B together. Now, the way that standard Medicare Part A and B work is that it's 80-20 coverage, meaning that Medicare covers 80% of your medical expenses and you're responsible for 20%. So you're left with paying 20% of those expenses, so you might want to also think about purchasing supplemental coverage to Medicare, which are called Medigap plans. And these Medigap plans often pick up that 20% that Medicare doesn't cover, but it also covers things that Medicare doesn't cover at all, like vision or dental or some of the other uh, benefits not covered by Medicare. Now, there's also Medicare Part D, and this is the prescription drug coverage that's available through Medicare. And each state has different plans available to you, so you want to look at which plans are, work for you and make sure that your prescription drugs are covered by that specific plan. And the way that a standard Medicare Part D plan works is that each year you have a deductible that you have to pay out of pocket first, and then Medicare will kick in. And in 2013, the deductible for Part D is $325. And then when you're between $326 and $2,970, you're, uh, you're responsible for paying 25% of your prescription drug expenses, and Medicare pays 75%. And then when you're between $2,971 and $4,750, you're responsible for 100% of your prescription drug expenses, and Medicare pays nothing. But then once you reach $4,750, Medicare kicks back in and pays 95% of your expenses, and you're only responsible for 5% of your prescription drug expenses. So that's why we call this the Medicare Part D donut hole, because there's no coverage in the center. And that's actually one of the things that the Affordable Care Act is changing over time. So in 2013, uh, when someone hits their donut hole, when someone reaches $2,971 in expenses, they only have to pay 47.5% of their brand name drugs and 79% of their generic drugs. So over time, that donut hole will close. Now, Medicare Part C is also called Medicare Advantage plans. And these are this is Medicare coverage through a managed care system. So um, you're actually getting Medicare Part A, Part B, and Part D coverage all through coordinated managed care. And the options that are available to you through Medicare Part C vary from state to state, so you can contact Medicare and find out what's specifically available to you. Now, again, Medicare Part C is different than Medigap plans, 
which are picking up coverage for things that Medicare doesn't cover. So that brings us to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also referred to as the Affordable Care Act or the ACA or health care reform. And the location that you can go to to find out information about all of the, the upcoming health care reforms, including the ones that have already been in effect over the last three years, again, I would point you to healthcare.gov. So in addition to finding out your health insurance options, you can find out information about um, health care reform under healthcare.gov. And certainly we couldn't cover a thousand pages of legislation in this one phone call today, um, but we can give you an overview of some of the consumer protections that are definitely relevant to people in the cancer community. And the first is that the ACA prohibits insurers from canceling your coverage when you try to use it. So this was a pretty standard practice. Uh, and moving forward, insurance companies can't cancel your policy unless you commit fraud on your application or if you stop paying your premiums. The ACA also eliminates lifetime limits on, an, on coverage. So if you previously had a $1 million limit on your policy, that's no longer there, and you won't face a situation where once you reach that coverage, you're effectively left without any health insurance coverage. The ACA has also um, regulated the way that annual limits are used and will do so through the end of this year. And then beginning in 2014, the ACA will also eliminate annual limits on all essential health benefits. And then there's something called the medical loss ratio, or the 80-20 rule. And this is a requirement that health insurance companies spend 80 to 85% of, their, uh, of your premiums on care, as opposed to spending that money on administrative costs. And if insurance companies do spend more money on administrative costs, they actually have to refund consumers and employers that offer health insurance coverage a portion of their premiums. So it's not just the requirement, but it has some teeth to it that if they're not spending uh, money on care, that that money has to come back to you. And then the ACA also requires most health insurance plans to offer free preventive care. And when I say free, I mean that insurance companies can't charge you uh, a copay, uh, any coinsurance amount, and it can't be applied to your deductible. So free preventive services are things like cholesterol screening and diabetes screening and immunizations and cancer screenings. And if you wanted to see the full list of preventive services that this provision applies to, you can go to healthcare.gov and search for preventive services and you would get the full list. Now the ACA also expanded access to coverage for young adults and for children. And one of the ways that it did that was by allowing young adults to stay on their parents' health insurance plan until they turned 26. And previously young adults would either have to be a full-time student or dependent under IRS standards, and that's no longer the case. Even if the young adult is married, they can still stay on their parents' health insurance plan. Now, beginning in September of 2010, children up to the age of 19 couldn't be denied health insurance coverage. So insurance companies weren't allowed to deny any children if they had a pre-existing medical condition. However, for adults, we have to wait for this protection until 2014. And that's a significant change to our healthcare system. It's one of the, the biggest reasons that people can't get access to health insurance coverage is because of their pre-existing conditions. And that will no longer be the case beginning in January. In addition, the ACA limits the way that insurance companies can decide how, to, how much to charge you for your policy. And this is called premium rating. So the ACA limits those things to four when they're looking at how much to charge you for your policy. So they can look at whether or not you're buying a policy for an individual or family, because clearly if you're buying a policy for 
a family, it's going to be more than if you're just covering one person. They can look at your age. They can look at your geographic location. And they can look at whether or not you use tobacco. Now, with tobacco, a number of states have actually gone one step further and said that you can't use tobacco use as a reason to charge someone more for their health insurance policy. So examples would be California, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and a number of other states have made that decision. And with age, even though they allow insurance companies to look at age, they cap how high or how much more an insurance company can charge someone who's older. And so someone who's 64 can only be charged three times more than someone who's 21. So they limit how much more someone can be charged. Now the ECA also actually expands access to coverage by expanding the Medicaid programs in each state. So there'll be a new category of eligibility for Medicaid, and it will be for all adults who have a household income up to 138% of the federal poverty level. And that comes out to be $15,856 a year in 2013. So if you make under that amount as an individual, you'll have access to Medicaid in your state if your state decides to expand access to their program. Because with the result of the Supreme Court decision, it became voluntary for states to decide whether or not they were going to expand their Medicaid program. And currently, there's 24 states who have decided to move forward and expand their Medicaid programs. And then there's a number of states who are looking at some other options. And then there are some states who have chosen not to. So in order to find out if your state is expanding coverage, you can go to healthcare.gov and find that information. Now, the ACA also creates a second way for people to get access to new health insurance coverage options and that's through the health insurance marketplaces. So these marketplaces are also called exchanges, and some states have decided to name their own exchanges or marketplaces. And so those three different terms can be used interchangeably. Um, and you can go to healthcare.gov to be directed to your state marketplace. But all of the plans that are being offered through the marketplace are standardized. And the way that they're being standardized is through their cost share and they're named by metal level. So for example, a bronze plan would have a 60-40 cost share, meaning that the plan would cover 60% of your expenses and you'd be responsible for 40%. And it goes up by 10 to the platinum level plan, which covers 90% of your medical expenses and you're responsible for 10%. There will also be a fifth plan option available called catastrophic coverage. And these plans will only be available to individuals who are young adults up to the age of 30 or qualify for the financial hardship exemption. Now, people who decide to buy health insurance coverage through their state marketplace will actually um, have the option to qualify for uh, premium tax credits and cost-sharing subsidies, which are two forms of financial assistance to actually help you buy health insurance coverage in the exchange and lower your medical expenses. There will also be caps on the deductibles for the plans sold in the marketplaces and also caps on out-of-pocket costs. So the combination of these protections actually make health insurance coverage more affordable and help us as consumers make sure that our health insurance expenses won't exceed a certain amount. So we actually know what our costs will be going into it. Now, because healthcare reform is being implemented at multiple levels, so at the federal level, through federal agencies, through states and state agencies, it's important to look at what's specifically going on in your state as healthcare reform is implemented. So again, you can start with healthcare.gov and it will direct you back to what's going on in your state for more information. Now, if you need assistance getting prescription medications and paying for prescription medications, there are a number of resources that are available to you. But generally, when looking at your prescription insurance, there's a couple of tips that you should keep in mind. 
And the first is that most health insurance policies have some type of prescription drug benefit. And it may be managed either by your health insurance company or a company other than your health insurance company. So it's often called a third-party administrator. And either your company or the third-party administrator will have rules about which pharmacies you can go to and which mail order pharmacies you can receive prescriptions from. And it's important that you follow the rules to make sure that your drugs are actually covered and you don't end up getting denied and have to pay out of pocket. So make sure that you look at your insurance card and your policy information uh, to when you're getting your prescriptions, and then also keep careful notes when you're communicating with your health insurance company. Each uh, prescription drug plan has something called a formulary, which is a list of the medications that they will cover. There's usually also rules uh, related to the formulary if you have to get pre-authorization in order to get one of those prescription drugs, meaning that you have to get permission first from the insurance company uh, before you can get coverage for a particular drug. And it's important to realize that it's the insurance company, not your physician, that decides what drug is on their formulary. So if you do come across a situation where your doctor is prescribing you a drug that isn't on the formulary, you can talk with your doctor to see if there's a drug that is similar to the drug that the doctor prescribed on the actual formulary. And then if not, you should talk both with your healthcare provider and with your insurance company about getting special permission to take that drug and have it be covered by your insurance. Oftentimes there's something called step therapy that's required and the insurance company can require you first to take a drug that is on the formulary or oftentimes to first take a generic version of that drug and see if it works for you before moving to the brand name version of that drug. Uh, and so that's called step therapy. And then if your co coverage is denied, you can go through the appeals process to try to get it covered. And it's very important that you work with your healthcare team in that process, and it will improve your chances of getting your drugs covered. And that applies to the rest of your care as well. Now, if you do end up in a situation where you might have to pay out of pocket for your drugs, or you have a copay, which is your portion of what you need to pay for your drugs, there are patient assistance programs available, um, and these assistance programs don't necessarily exclude you if you don't have a low income. So the moral of the story is don't assume that you don't qualify and check to see if you do. So it doesn't um, necessarily mean that you won't qualify if you have some income. And these are some good examples of the patient assistance programs that are available that help with prescription drugs. And they include Needy Meds, the Patient Access Network, Health Well Foundation, and Cancer Care. So now I'm gonna transition and talk briefly about employment and disability insurance options that are available. And the reason why we want to talk about this is because many people who are going through treatment are able to continue working. But those that feel like they can't take time off from employment, whether it's on a temporary basis or permanently. And it's also important to remember that it's your decision to decide whether or not you're going to disclose information about your medical condition to your employer. And the moral of every story is to make sure that you're communicating with your healthcare team. So when you ask them to fill out paperwork for the FMLA leave or for a reasonable accommodation, talk to them about what you do and your desires related to working through treatment or taking time off because they certainly can't read your mind. So if you tell them what you're looking for, they can be very helpful in filling out that paperwork. Now the Family and Medical Leave Act, which is also called the FMLA, can be used to take time off either for your own serious medical condition or as a caregiver when you're caring for a spouse, a parent, or a child. But you have to meet the eligibility criteria. And the first is that you work for that employer for at least 12 months 
and you work for at least 1,250 hours during those 12 months, which means that you're working about 32 hours a week if you worked all 52 weeks a year. You also have to work for an employer with at least 50 employees. And what you get from the FMLA is 12 weeks of unpaid leave, but it's job protected and it protects your health insurance benefits as well. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, uh, is a federal law that applies to private employers with 15 or more employees and to state and local governments. Federal employees are also protected under a similar law to the ADA. And it doesn't just apply to employees, but it also protects job applicants. So that's very useful to someone who has taken time off work and is looking to go back into the workforce. So the ADA doesn't just protect you against discrimination in the workplace, but also gives you access to something called a reasonable accommodation. And reasonable accommodations are things that will help you do your job. So if it can be changes to your schedule, it can be changes to your physical workspace, maybe using some type of technology, or it can even be a change in a company policy. So for example, if you're only allowed to rest periods during the, during the day, changing the policy and allowing you additional rest periods in the day might be a potential accommodation. So for more information about accommodations, you can contact the Job Accommodation Network, and their website is askjan.org, uh, or you can contact the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, at eeoc.gov. But there are also state fair employment laws, which actually might be more protective for you than the ADA. So it's important to look at the state fair employment laws available to you as well. And then if you do need to take time off from work and you're unable to work anymore, you can look at the Social Security Disability Insurance Program, which is one of the two federal long-term disability insurance programs available. And in order to qualify for SSDI, you have to have worked long enough and recently enough and paid into the Social Security retirement system. And you have to have a medical condition that meets the Social Security Administration's definition of disability. So for more information about SSDI, you can contact the Social Security Administration at ssa.gov. There are also other types of disability insurance. Um, also, the Federal Supplemental Security Income Program, or SSI. You can also purchase disability insurance directly from an insurance company or have a disability insurance plan available to you through your employee benefits package. And then there are also a few states that offer state disability insurance, including California, Hawaii, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Puerto Rico. Now, because taking time off and medical bills can seriously impact someone's income and leave someone with medical debt, uh, we wanted to provide you with some resources on how to get access to financial assistance and managing your bills. Uh, and so there are a number of financial assistance options available to you, both through nonprofit organizations, private organizations. You should also look at your local, state, and county organizations that offer financial assistance to you. And then if you're looking for assistance with managing bills, coming up with a budget, or dealing with medical debt, the National Foundation of Credit Counseling or some other type of accredited credit counseling program uh, is a good resource for you. Now, if you decide that you want to work with a financial advisor to handle your finances, you want to make sure that that individual is credentialed and that they not only have experience with working with finances, but specifically do they have experience working with individuals with cancer? And are they familiar with aspects of a cancer diagnosis that would be impacting you, such as health insurance coverage, disability benefits, life insurance options, and reverse mortgage, mortgages. And then before you hire anyone, you want to check to see how they are determining any fees that they're going to charge you for helping you. 
So some other tips that we wanted to share with you related to finances. Some retirement funds actually allow you to borrow from that fund if you have a medical hardship. And so you might be able to withdraw early with a lower penalty for early withdrawal. And so if that's something that you're interested in, you should talk with your financial advisor. Life insurance can also be a source of income. You can take loans against your life insurance policy. There's also something called an accelerated death benefit. And then you can also um, look at viatical settlements, which are effectively selling your life insurance policy to someone else. So they give you the value of your policy, but then you have to realize that the people who you had life insurance for, so if you have a family and they were going to be the beneficiary, will no longer be the beneficiary. But it is a good source of income if you need it. So again, you want to make sure to talk to an advisor if that's something you're looking at. Reverse mortgages operate similarly. For individuals who are 62 or older, you can borrow against your home equity um, and get some money out of your house to pay for bills. But again, definitely talk with a financial counselor. So when you're managing medical debt, we want to leave you with the idea that there are resources available, and certainly a patient-empowered approach can help. And you definitely don't want to put off dealing with your medical bills so you want to start now in trying to address them. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you, Joanna. So we will now be conducting a question and answer session. You may ask a question through the Q&A box to the right of your screen. Uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to submit a question. Okay, thank you. Our first question is for Joanna. Um, I'm having on-the-job difficulties related to my cancer. Who can help me understand my legal rights? Joanna? Well, I would definitely start by um, looking at the Coping with the Cost of Care booklet um, from the cancer support community to understand more about the ADA, your state fair employment laws, uh, and um, how accommodations might help you. But again, the Job Accommodation Network is specifically set up to help employers and employees navigate the accommodations process. So if that's your issue, I would look there. And then if you're feeling like you might be discriminated against in the workplace or want more information generally about your employment rights, I would look both to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC which enforces the ADA, and also your state fair employment agency. And so that information can give you uh, a perspective on what your employment rights are. And then if you find that you're in a situation where your employer isn't complying with their obligations, then you can either file complaints with those state or federal agencies, or you can look at hiring an employment attorney. Um, but certainly starting with figuring out what your options and rights are is a good first step. Thank you, Joanna. This is actually Allison with the Cancer Support Community. We also have another question that's come in, um, and this would be Joanna regarding Part D coverage. Um, this individual says that their third-party provider charges the same price for generic as branded uh, drug. Um, is this uh, not an unfair price control, and or how would you address this? Joanna. <laughs> I think that, um, so the situation with Part D, and I, I would probably want some more information before mm -hmm. I can answer this directly, but... Part D, I explained a standard Part D plan, but if you pay a higher monthly premium for Part D, you might have a lower deductible or you might not have a deductible at all, or the way that that donut hole works might be entirely different as well. And so we have kind of this generic standard plan, 
then the plans that are actually available to people might be very different depending on how much you're willing to actually pay for the plan. So in because they're structured differently, it might be uh, more beneficial to the consumer to have the generic and the brand name drugs cost the same, or it might be not beneficial. So it's, it's hard to say generically um, if it's unfair or not. Mm-hmm. But if you were concerned about your Part D plans, you can, you can call Medicare. You can go onto Medicare.gov and look at the other health insurance options that are available to you for Part D plans specifically in your geographic region. Or you could also contact uh, the State Health Insurance Assistance Program. So in every state, there is a program, a local program, available to people to navigate Medicare options and any issues that might be, you might be having, whether it's appeals or access to prescription drugs. And so if you go to Medicare.gov, and search State Health Insurance Assistance Programs or SHIP programs, then you can find information about your state's contacts specifically. Great. Thank you. Um, We also have another question, and I think this is really directed towards both um, Joanna and Sean. Um, This individual wants to know if you have any suggestions for, you know, if somebody is low on energy due to treatment or the cancer ex- itself, how to kind of some tips on dealing with that and navigating this, and also, um, you know, when they kind of maybe encounter a hostile um, or uncooperative environment, whether they weren't specific in that, but I'll say maybe work and or maybe dealing with um, health insurance companies, how to, how to deal with that. Well, certainly I could answer the uh, low on energy part. <clears throat> uh, I mean, I do think that that's a pretty common side effect of cancer treatment, and uh, you could certainly do anything from uh, talking with your health care providers about, about the lower energy level and whether they can make some suggestions uh, to getting involved in support groups and see how other folks uh, are handling that situation. The hospital work environment one I'll leave to Joanna, though. Well, I think in that hostile work environment, I mean, there's there's two sides to the equation. So you have the law which entitles you to protections, but then you also have the practical aspect of when employers aren't following the law, right? So if we just needed the law, you wouldn't need law enforcement or lawyers. Um, so just having the law isn't enough, but knowing what your rights are is a good first step. But then if you're in a situation where no matter what you do or how you try to approach the employer, either by educating them what their obligations are um, or sharing tools and resources from these federal agencies or programs, if they're still not willing to work with you or at least provide an environment that isn't hostile, then you do have the option to file complaints. If you want to try to mediate that option, that's also available through the EEOC or State Fair Employment Agency. But I think trying to get at the the core of why it's hostile can certainly help. So if it's initially hostile because you've asked for a reasonable accommodation, employers might not really understand what that means or that typically it doesn't really cost the employer anything to provide an accommodation. So there's... a Part of the hostile environment can sometimes be about people's perceptions. And how do you try to address those perceptions ahead of time? But I would also give you the resource of Cancer and Careers, which is a national organization which specifically focuses on work and cancer and helping you navigate through some of the practical aspects of conversations that you might have with the employer, how do you ask for certain things, um, and how do you build a more positive working environment. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. Our next question is for Joanna. Uh, Do you have any suggestions for obtaining college loans for dependent children while the parent is going through cancer treatment? So there are a number of, or well, I shouldn't say a number because I feel like that number is decreasing, but there are some organizations in the cancer community that provide financial assistance for children 
whose parent has cancer. Um, so you would have to, you know, do a Google search for those or look at some of the financial assistance resources that are available um, in the cancer community specifically. Uh, but when you're talking about loans, that's sometimes different. And I, I don't know of any organizations that are providing loans specifically for dependent children. But there are, but there is some financial assistance out there. Okay, thank you. Our next question is for Sean. Uh, my mother has cancer, and I'm concerned that she's overwhelmed due to her diagnosis, but then also had to pay out-of-pocket expenses due to treatment. Do you have any recommendations so that I can help her feel less overwhelmed? Sean. Um, well, certainly I would suggest that he involve himself in one of the caregiver support groups as well. I mean, I keep on harping on the support groups, but that's exactly what we're here for is to talk about how to handle situations just like this. Uh, that's, that would be my initial recommendation. Um, not sure what else I could think of after that. Okay, great. Joanna, do you have anything to add to that? No. Okay. okay. Um, our next question is for Joanna. Where can I get help with estate planning and legal issues, such as writing my will or granting a power of attorney? So if you want specific assistance um, with estate planning functions, um, there's a couple of different resources. So there, I would first look at, depending on your income level, your local legal aid. And to find information about local legal assistance, I would point you towards lawhelp.org. And when you go to lawhelp.org, you can pick your state and then your county and find the legal assistance organizations that are available to you. Um, because they're going to be able to help you determine what type of estate planning or medical decision-making documents you might need specifically. So some people, a will might be more appropriate. For some people, a trust might be more appropriate. Um, specifically for medical decision-making questions, there is an organization called Caring Connections, and you can go to that website and find information about different types of medical decision-making documents, but the information is state-specific. So on that website, you can download the Advanced Healthcare Directive form specifically for your state. Um, and then if you have a higher income level and aren't going to qualify for some type of legal assistance, then looking at your county bar association that's certified and has a lawyer referral service. So you can call up and get referrals to multiple attorneys in your area that specifically handle estate planning issues. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Sean. Um, any closing thoughts before before we close out today, Joanna or Sean? No, some great questions that were asked. That was for sure. And I would just say that we, this was to provide an overview of these issues and to get you start thinking about these things and to point you towards additional resources. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your enthusiasm and questions that have contributed to making today's webinar a great success. If you would like more detailed information, please check out our free Frankly Speaking About Cancer, Coping with the Cost of Care booklet, which is available to download or to order on our website, which can be found at orders.cancersupportcommunity.org. Also, please feel free to visit our website or call CSC's toll-free line at 1-888-793-9355 if you'd like any additional information. Again, we would like to thank our wonderful speakers, Joanna Morales and Sean Hevel, for contributing their time and sharing this important information with us. Again, we'd like to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, the Patient Access Network Foundation. CSC would also like to thank our Cost of Care Program supporters, Celgene, Genentech, Jansen, Lily, and Onyx. Please take a moment to complete our post-event online survey, which you will be redirected to. It is a brief survey, and we greatly appreciate any feedback you may have. Thank you for your participation.